Welcome to another teardown and test video. This time it's a Tektronix scope. Yes, we like to go from the cheapest to the more <laughs> expensive and fantastic. This scope was really, really top of the pops. Very, very desirable back in the 90s and 80s. This one is, of course, a lot newer compared to a lot of other scopes that I've been tearing down. So look at this. This is channel one and channel two, but there's another module in again with channel one and channel two. And then the time base. So maybe we are lucky. This thing should be able to do four channels at the same time. This is some, of course something we're going to play a little bit with and see if this is uh, correct. There's a very, very complicated time base because it's a dual time base. So it, it will be able to do zoom and uh, probably it will be able to do different time bases on the two different channel modules at the same time on the, sc on the screen. This is something that I'm looking a lot forward to see if this works. And also, storage how is that huh and i think this is the really really special analog storage that was stored inside the the screen using yeah well the screen was actually the storage very very complicated way they made this and it looks like it can do upper lower some store and some Recall. Yeah, we really need to see if that is working. And then we pull this to turn it on. This one is nine kilos. So it's very, very heavy. I will now try and show you guys the back. So this is how you clean the screen and clean the colored plastic for our contrast. This is really, really old. Look how somebody's been using their, I don't know, a ball pen or a, a sharp pointer to show something on the screen. It's just full of vertical and horizontal lines where somebody's been pointing. Why would you point on a plastic screen with something that is sharp unless you're absolutely brain dead? Please think what you're doing, man. And uh, the top plastic part, they're of course thinking about everything. You're not going to lose the screws. Oh, no. And the top, if you don't know this, but this little thing here is so you can hold a camera. Because back then, you didn't have a print function or ethernet connection or all these fancy things that we enjoy today. No, you just hang on your camera, a Polaroid camera, and then you take a picture. So this is what this is for. And this is the back part. Uh, yeah, what? Okay, so you can. I am hoping this was set for 230. Pretty cool about pets and stuff. <laughs> I wonder how old this is. And oh, you're gonna get electrocuted, huh? Trace rotation. So, of course, this one consists of base or like the frame unit and this is of course the frame unit and uh, you can plug in almost anything into this different time bases different uh, channels and whatnot yips look at this this is exactly what we were looking for so this is something you need to do internally so that means all we need to do now is just plug it in and see if there is any kaboom Hey, look at that. 
Isn't this just the fuse holder that is broken or is it missing? Hey, why didn't I see this before when we looked at the back? This is of course why it's not working. I need to fix this. All right, easy, easy access. They even made it easy to figure out how you assemble this again. A little bit worried about this. Mm -hmm. Some burnt dust. And I'm still trying to dig my way into the fuse holder in here somewhere. <laughs> Look at that cute wire. That's just beautiful. So yeah, that will be the modules. But we need to get in here somewhere. So this is the bottom plate. And the three plug-in modules. Look what I found inside. Tested by Rudy. So he did a good job. Some 50 years ago or something. Unused line selector block and unused line fuse. Isn't that just cute? Extra fuses. And here is the line selection. How that is done. So maybe you... Well, you need to consult the manual to figure this out. Or maybe this is just the different models. Ah, it says here. Brown. What is this one? And the red one. S220. Isn't that just cool? So this is how it's done. <laughs> and then you just put the other one here. And then you're happy. That is okay. One way to do it. Pretty cool. I can't remember I've seen anything like that before. I actually have seen extra spare fuses all over the place in all sorts of units. But this is, I always like it. I'm still trying to work my way down to the main fuse. It's down there somewhere. I don't know if I can... Can I get my finger down here and can I fix it? Yeah, maybe I can if I'm really, really smart. This is, of course, the high voltage supply. Look at that. A thick film circuit. It's still full of dust because I couldn't get... All my compressed air in here. I didn't open this part when I was out with the compressed air. So there's this shield or protection. So I guess all the high voltage, so it's 3400 volts. You adjust it here and you just measure it on the CRT socket, pin 2. Easy peasy. So all you have to do is just remove the back cover and you will access the scope tube but first we need to repair this or change the fuse solder it looks like i can yeah if i'm really good we will see here is the on off switch with the long arm see there's a little plastic thing here connected to the switch i think this is prone to break because this switch is really, really hard to pull, see? So this is definitely going to break. Also, the two sides of the power cable, one goes to the switch and the other one goes straight to the fuse. And then the other side of the fuse goes to the back side of the high voltage. See, a thermal switch. And of course, if something is going to blow up and burn and really do bad things, it will be in the high voltage supply, most likely, where bad things happen first. So it's just good you disconnect mains. And then mains also comes through the other switch, the other side of the switch here. And look, it goes to those two tiny little cables and connectors here on the bottom board and this is of course the where the voltage selector is and that will be all the cables for the mains transformator all the different voltages and stuff this is here it's done 
And there's another fuse hidden in here, doing all sorts of cool things, I guess. All right, so all I need to do is add a fuse. I'm not super proud of this solution, but hey, I just needed to see if this damn thing is working or not, because there's no way I can access the fuse holder in here without disassembling the whole thing. It's just not going to happen. So I moved the output wire from, from the fuse and then cut this wire from the switch. So that means I got my, my fuse here and it's good enough for testing. And I've been thinking a little bit about this. Why would somebody remove the fuse holder thing? A very good reason is there's something wrong with this unit and they don't want anybody to accidentally power it up. So I think finally we're going to see a kaboom when I turn this on. This fuse is going to explode. Don't you think so? I am ready to push the switch here because I pulled everything here and then I can do it. Are you ready? Now. 50 watts, 60 watts. No. No kaboom. 60 watts. Okay. Let's see if we get some picture. I, of course, I need to poke around with all the knobs, but okay. Okay, so this is a better angle. I don't know why, where to put the light. I don't think we need that much light. I'm going to turn it on again. I see light here, so that is good. I was maybe expecting a little bit more light. So, okay, intensity, we need more of that. Beam finder. Yes, look at that. Beam. Okay. No response. Time base is not running. Uh huh. This is the Ooh. Okay, so we got a dot. I'm gonna push beam finding. Hmm. Let's see. What is that one doing? Oh, that looks scary. There's definitely some. Ah, this is storage. Look at that. Different storage here. Turn this off. Is it now back in? Oh, look at that. There's something going on here. Okay. okay I'll play a little bit, a bit, a little bit more with this, and then. I will get back. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be a year long video, okay? I think I managed to figure this out. <laughs> Look at that. One, two, three, four. So, yes, this thing is an analog four channels. Isn't that just amazing? You can also just say one here, one here, or none here, just have this, and you get the indications here. What is, oops, what is turned on? So if you turn on a channel, so this is a display anything from this plugin module, or you turn it off, if you turn it on again, it's that channel. So it's really cool with the light here. So you'll see what is going on. So normally you only show, let's turn this off, one or two. But if you push both of them at the same time, yes, of course you can do that. Then it's both this one and that one. If you 
just play something over here and now it's in chop mode but you can also run it alternating see now it's doing one at a time let's take all four do 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 so it's easier to see what it's doing but of course in chop mode it will chop it all all up into tiny little pieces all right let's see uh, what kind of bandwidth this sucker got huh let's play a little bit with the storage you can see the input signal here see it's actually storing now so here's how it works upper and lower and upper and lower for erasing so this is erasing you're erasing the top or the bottom so see you can see there's this flash so every time you you erase it's flashing like that so so this is how that works and this is the the storage where you're storing at the moment so if i input a signal like that and then i can erase everything else i did enable storage and crank up the the brightness see now when i remove the input uh, signal we still have our curve but it's of course very dim this is how it works and you can then make it go away and go back again and then you can put in your signal in another track and put it down here and you can you can use the upper and the lower that is just the half of the screen and it will it will stay there for quite a while and it is let's see if i i should actually try and put in something on this channel instead enable that one I have it down here oh i got my trigger and i should play with the trigger so it's here and the time base and yada yada oh, it's a little bit it's going to take a little bit of time but the thing is that you can put in another signal on the other one or in the other half so that is uh, how it works like that i, I was actually lucky push this button I, so see let's erase again here is our, our signal. Okay. I don't know. I need to play a little bit more with the trigger because it's not triggering on that. Why aren't you doing that? See here, I got some input. I need to uh, worry about that as well. But anyway, uh, that was just a short experiment with the with the storage. So it's analog storage. So that was uh, pretty cool, and it seems to be working. And let's turn off everything else, and let's just play a little bit with um, with this input here. All right, so let's play with the input. This is one kilohertz. Let's crank up the level until, uh -huh, so this is not working. Ooh, I got some dodgy. It is working in calibration. It's not working. Hmm. Yeah, that is, of course, disappointing. So I was actually able to find something that was not working. Haha. -ha. Okay, I have been playing a little bit with the bandwidth and the trigger. I am not able to get it to run that fast so this is really a low frequency scope because this is like 500 kilohertz that's it and now i'm having a little bit of problems with the trigger it is really really critical now and uh, i am in the fastest time base so see there's nothing more to i can't go any faster 
this is calibrate so yeah so this is 500 kilohertz and if i crank up the the frequency you can now see that the level goes a lot low lower so this is two megahertz and it's really really low so the, i mean this scope triggers quite well at 300 or oh, let's go a little bit down 200 okay 230 i was lucky yeah it is okay that's that's actually good so okay under 200 kilohertz and then the trigger is really good again great great and this is again the fastest time base and there's no attenuation fantastic and a great picture up to 200 kilohertz but let's try again yep see starts to, to get some like some noise and some jitter but so this scope is really a low frequency scope but four channels so that's quite interesting i didn't no, because I didn't read any manuals or anything yet, but of course we can do that. Now we know the numbers of the different plug-in modules. It could be fun to see if this is really true. Also, if you take a Tektronic probe, you will notice this little springy thing. And there is a hidden resistor in here from this. And this is even supported in the very, very early scopes. Look at this, when you set the voltage to, for example, 0.5 volts per division, and you plug in a times 10 Pro. Oops, do you see the light change position? So now it's 5 volts per division. Isn't that just cool? This is how they make the scaling, and it's all automatic. See, isn't that fantastic? Pulling out the first module, I see this little thingy. You pull in that one. So when you pull this, see? And this one grips into that one. So this is how it locks. When we're inspecting the module, I don't really see any screws, but it looks like the top and the bottom just slides out something like this or is it pressed oh it's pressed in okay so that was easy okay so this is the input board this is the ac dc switch pretty cool oh it's a shielded capacitor look at that see that is really nice. So of course this is a non-polarized capacitor and with the other shielded. Fantastic. And like I said, all four channels, the variable gain has absolutely no effect uh, unless it's in, in Cal. So, and there's a, like a feeling of a switch in the end so i believe there will be a switch that is working but the potentiometers in all of them is not working i don't really believe that is possible so there must be a reason for that can't be like that on all of them can it oh look at that and socket this one looks like it's a socket but there isn't really a lot of electronics in here I see a really nice attenuator made. Oh, this is the switches. Probably have all the resistors and stuff down there. I also see some holes for some trimmer capacitors for frequency compensation. Input resistor there. So, yeah, not a lot of stuff. Let's see the backside. Yeah, and this is the backside of the input module. I really like the switches located exactly where you want the the function so you don't need to transport uh, high frequency signals this is exactly how to do it of 
quite beautiful. Got one more thing to notice inside the input module. See, 1970. And also what I found on the back side. Oh, the swats, huh? How cool is that? But don't you think this 31176, that is actually the manufacturer of this particular uh, unit? I think this is a very good guess. So this is the time base unit. And it is... looking like that and also I see a really big capacitor here pretty cool look at that PCB this is a multi-layer board at least four layers right and what I see down here is 1971 so I think this is one of the earliest uh, multi-layer PCBs that I have seen in uh, FR4, I guess. And this is the top side. I wonder what that hole is doing. Really weird. And again, you see these really, really long push rods and long arms for dials and oh, and really nice shielding. And up here on this board, there's also written 1971. It's a really a beautiful PCB layout. And it looks a lot like it. This is a four layer board, the way that I see. Yeah, I see those tracks and this is uh, ground on layer two. And then again, yep, this gotta be a four layer board. So that is really, really nice to see that. Let's look inside the plugin modules. See the base PCB, got 1970 written on it. Really nice and clean design. And also, what you see down there, the uh, metal springs to create a good shield contact, because everything else here is plastic on the top and the bottom part. So that means each module isn't really connected to any metal, only only at the back, together with uh, all the signals. And this is a good way to prevent uh, ground loops. This is where you want stuff to be connected. Also, I found this information here uh, on the on the sticker on the back. This is a uh, backside of the CRT. So that means it was sent for repair and calibration in ninety one. 1981 so if this one is from 76 or 70 something you see it didn't take long for it to break down the first time and then it was sent for repair and let's look inside with the main transformator and the power supply board I think this is actually just a voltage selector board. I don't really see a lot of power supply stuff going on on that board, beside those two fuses. I thought I cleaned this up a little bit, but it's still looking a little bit dirty, isn't it? And there's a little PCB here on the side you can pull out if you want to. And yeah, there is a little bit of power supply and stuff here on the back with the rectifier for the two big capacitors that's like located here and again this is only a two layer PCB yep I think there's not that much more to say about this I think I'll put it together and play a little bit more with the storage 
So this is the high voltage supply, high voltage transformator. This is just a flyback, pretty simple design. Some diodes and high voltage regulation, the sense resistors and all that stuff. Or this is the voltage resistors for focus uh, uh, and, and those grids. And here we got the deflection amplifiers, horizontal and vertical. And again, this is only good for a, a couple of megahertz according to the manual. However, I tested this with a like one megahertz bandwidth tops. And this is the storage control. And it's uh, just switching on and off some pretty low voltages uh, around the uh, end of the CRT. And you will see a lot of trimmers down here. See, that is for the storage, how that is adjusted for balance, non storage and store level and erasure and all those things that is has something to do with the storage. Yeah, it also says here storage board. Yep. See? And all those voltages they are very pretty close to the chassis voltage and this is why you can just have cables going like this this is not a lot of thousand volts apart uh, cathode supply and filament supply that is minus 3000 so that is of course a little bit better handled uh, there's a shielded cable here one of those um, handling the minus the uh, 3000 so yeah shouldn't be dangerous now it's a few days ago since I played with this last time so I think I can boot it up and uh, play a little bit more Some laser trimming high voltage dividers Ooh, that is sexy let's play a little bit with storage as you can see, it's uh, quite bright in here. Uh, you can even see my re reflections in the screen. Uh, this pulse is, oh, look at that. Ooh, a little bit of loose connection, see? Let's just erase everything. And we're back again. So this is 100 milliseconds high, and then it repeats every second. So this is how bright it is possible to, uh, to make this. And, uh, you can actually see the signal. It's easier to read the signal uh, compared to if we remove storage. You'll see it's just going to look like this. Uh, and what if the signal was only once per 20 seconds or something? Then it's not that easy to uh, to see what's going on, right? So let's see. Storage uh, feature actually helps a lot to see uh, pulses like this. But the storage actually need some time for the phosphor to learn the signal. So if we change this uh, instead of being 100 um, milliseconds, let's change this to 10 milliseconds. And it's still the same repeat. And now, of course, I have to change the time base to 5 and then erase. So that means the pulse is 10 times as fast and the time base, everything is 10 times as fast, right? And it looks a little bit dimmer, doesn't it? Let's try and go a little bit more. One millisecond pulse. And then let's dial again. Here. And then erase. Now you can see the signal is much more dim. You can still see the signal. Of course, we can go 0 0.1 milliseconds if we want to. And then go again like this. See, now the time is so fast, the phosphor is not going to get stored. I, I mean, the, the beam that draws this uh, nice uh, pulse 
is not affecting the phosphor and the storage is not working. And this is, uh, yeah, 100 microseconds, uh, the pulse. So it isn't really fast in any way, but yeah, this just uh, shows the capabilities of the, the storage. You need time to store the, the energy. Okay, I think I already mentioned about the storage is uh, the well, the screen is divided into two halves. Right now, I am using everything on, both the top and the bottom part, it says here upper and lower. For this is the storage and this is the erase and show. So let me show you guys this. Now I only have the top enabled and I do an erase. You'll actually see the storage is not as good as if I enable all of it and again erase. See, it is a lot better. And this is, uh, I think this has something to do with adjustments because it should actually be able to do the same uh, because you got um, different um, electron guns or like beams for, for storing and maintaining the pictures and uh, they should be adjusted to only cover the right uh, area and they should of course be strong enough to maintain the picture correctly. So if I say that I only have storage now on the bottom halves, so this is the signal as it is without storage and now I change the position so this, the picture goes down and you'll see it is not as nice and as clear also Let's just erase again, so it's easier to see what's going on. Yep, it is the same. Not as nice and as sharp. And then we can just crank it up here, where there's no storage. So now I have a stored picture from some other signal that I need to compare, for example, and then the, the new signal that I need to see if it's the same or not, right? So. Yeah, and it, and it will stay like that for a pretty long time if everything was uh, adjusted uh, correctly. If I t t turn down the power here, it will be weaker and weaker and weaker, and it's actually just going to go away. Well, it's not that easy to show here. <laughs> so now I can enable storage Let's see if I can do this. Uh, yes, I can. It is difficult to push them both. But see, I still have my signal here at the bottom. And even if I deselect storage on the bottom, I can see. See, I can turn it on again. So now it's gone. And now it's back. So this is uh, this is pretty cool. So I should also be able to. Oops, nope. <laughs> now I killed. <laughs> now I killed it. All right. So now I need to do it again. But yeah, there's a little bit of uh, fun playing with the uh, old analog storage. So the idea is I just show you this really, really fast and you can hit pause and then you can read the text if you really want to. This is from the manual that I found online about the uh, 5111A uh, main unit with um, a, a dual storage so here is uh, the explain about uh, the storage circuit what I think is interesting is the four flood guns so we've got four of those okay this is inter interesting and here you can hit pause again and read the rest here if you want to otherwise I'm just gonna read it up it's not gonna be interesting and again here this explains a lot about how this works and about how the flood gun cathode control works and also about how the screen is divided into two halves. And yeah, I think that was the rest of the interesting stuff from the manual. I think it was 102. I saw something that was uh, interesting to repeat. Yes, here we go. So this is the standard scope stuff that is uh, absolutely normal to any scope that you will find. 
the deflection, the cathode, and this is the normal beam. So this is, of course, a single beam. This is the normal trace that is generated uh, by this circuit. And then, so we can go to uh, 110. 110 C. This is what they did. They made a separate diagram to show how the storage works. See, the lower screen and the upper screen screen is divided. And uh, so that means actually the, the front of this uh, the CRT is conductive. The inside is conductive and isolated between each other in two halves. And, and it is, of course, a transparent, this conductive uh, coating. So it's ultra insanely thin. And uh, so this is how the store and erase and all that works. So please read the manual here for more details about the different knobs and this the oscillator to generate the positive negative uh, signal here on this uh, cathode to, uh, to erase and to go into the storage modes. So yes, thank you very much and have a great day.